Welcome everyone to a very special and unique Notre Dame moment. Today we are joined uh, by Commander Mike Hopkins, who is joining us live from the International Space Station. We are absolutely privileged uh, to have uh, Commander Hopkins uh, join us. It's, uh, it is both an, an honor and we are so proud and grateful uh, to you, Commander Hopkins, and and members of the intrepid NASA team, the satellite uh, image today, and we have just a window of about 22 minutes, is going from the space station to Houston, and then from Houston live into Notre Dame studios here uh, on campus. And so we're very privileged for this uh, unique window of opportunity uh, to talk about life on the space station. Um, we're thrilled that, uh, that we consider uh, Commander Hopkins, a member of the Notre Dame family. He has entrusted us with the greatest gift that anyone can give to the University of Notre Dame. Uh, his son, who is a sophomore, uh, residing in Keough Hall, named Lucas, and uh, my understanding is having a great Notre Dame experience. And, uh, and, and, and we, um, are, we only have 22 minutes, so we're going to jump right into the questions here. So. Um, just to begin, uh, uh, Commander Hopkins, could you tell us a little bit about how many astronauts are you joined by and from where? And given the size of your living space and your workspace, um, how are you managing? And, and after four months on the space station, are you starting to feel a little bit cla claustrophobic? Well, first, I'd uh, like to just say hello to the Notre Dame family that's out there joining us tonight. Uh, welcome aboard the International Space Station. Uh, so the space station, you know, is about the inside volume is about the size of a 747. And so currently we have seven astronauts and cosmonauts on board. So we've got uh, two cosmonauts from Russia. We've got a Japanese astronaut and then we have four U.S. astronauts on, on board. Uh, that's probably about the max that you're going to have for any long extended piece of time. Um, though there's going to be periods when we have other crews coming up uh, before we go home where we're going to have up to, uh, let's see, we'll probably have up to 11 uh, folks on board, astronauts on board at one time. So that'll be pretty challenging. Uh, we'll be bumping elbows quite a bit at that point. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, for a short period of time, you can make it work because we, de we definitely don't have enough sleeping quarters and things like that for everybody. Uh, but again, you can just camp out for a few days and, and it's not too bad. But overall, it's not, uh, you know, from a claustrophobic standpoint, it's actually pretty big. And so you can, uh, you can, you know, not see your crewmates uh, during the day because you might be working in one module and they're somewhere else. And, and uh, so you don't see them a lot. Um, on the other hand, you could uh, all end up in the same module and you're, uh, and you're bumping elbows the whole time, and that can be pretty challenging, but again, uh, it all seems to work out pretty well. Terrific. We've received um, a number of questions about food and sleep and exercise. You look incredibly fit, so we know that exercise is going on. Can you, can you, tell, you tell us how you manage in those three areas? You know, one of the amazing things about up here is exercise is on the schedule. And, and so um, you actually have an opportunity to get uh, probably in better shape when you're up here because there's a couple hours every day are dedicated to, to exercise. And I know sometimes down on earth it's pretty tough. Uh, life seems to get in the way mm -hmm. of, uh, of always getting that exercise in. And so we tend to do it. Um, uh, we've got a, a three different machines that we can use. Uh, we have a weightlifting device, we have a treadmill, and we have a, an exercise bike. And we use those to prevent bone loss, to prevent muscle atrophy, and to prepare us for that returning to 1G down mm -hmm. on uh, when, we, when we land on Earth. As far as food is concerned, right now is actually dinner time on board, but we have all of our uh, individual portions of our food, and some of it comes in this, uh, like this green packet which is irradiated food, so it's kind of like your MREs. And then uh, we have the dehydrated stuff, so this is uh, tomatoes and artichokes. Uh, but uh, again, we have a, a pretty good variety up here, probably over 200 different dishes that, uh, that we have on board. The one thing that's probably a little hard to get used to from, uh, um, is from drinking. We drink out of these, uh, these bags with a straw, 
and it's not too bad when you're having water or juice or something of that nature but when you're drinking your uh, i'm a i drink tea uh but if you're a coffee person you don't get uh that smell that aroma mm -hmm. from the cup so it can be a little more challenging uh, but uh this is uh primarily how we uh, uh what our food comes in or, or packages like this and, and how about sleep commander hopkins hopkins how does that uh how do you how do you manage that Yeah, sleep is uh, is actually pretty good up here. Um, you know, we we have a sleeping bag, and you either strap it to the wall. Or everybody kind of has their own technique. Um, within the sleeping bag, you can kind of put yourself in a cocoon. Um, you've got uh, some straps that you could use if you want to if you want to fill uh, uh, that tightness. Uh, on the other hand, some people they like to just kind of float, and and so uh, for me, uh, I'm sleeping down in our Crew Dragon Resilience, and so it's kind of like a hammock. And it's, uh, it's not too bad. It's, it's pretty comfortable. Um, the one thing that you miss, though, is you know how you've had a long day and you're really tired. And when you lay down in bed, you just you take that load off your feet and it just feels really good. Well, up here, because we're floating all the time, you never have, uh, you're never taking the load off your feet and because you're always off, off your feet. Right. So you don't get that sensation at the end of the day when you're crawling into bed. Um, so that's a little bit different, but overall, I sleep very, very well. Fantastic. Well, this is your, um, my understanding, this is your second expedition uh, to the International Space Station. In 2013, you went up in a Russian vessel and uh, were on the space station. And then in November of this past year, at the end of November, you went up and have been up for, and you actually, in that case, you, you flew on the, um, uh, the, the new SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. So uh, a question about um, liftoff, how did it feel? Were you incredibly nervous? I, I certainly would be in my, my situation. And then in, in, in just uh, um, three minutes, you go from zero to uh, 10 times the speed of sound. My question is, in the intervening seven years from your expeditions, have you seen great increases in the technology and the comfort uh, for the astronauts along the way, or has not much changed? Yeah, so the, the launch is, is pretty amazing. And um, you are a little bit nervous, but the training really kicks in. And so you're just focused on your checklists and making sure everything is happening when it's supposed to happen. In terms of the vehicles, you know, the Soyuz that I flew on, it was designed back in the 60s. And so it is an older vehicle, uh, but they've made upgrades over the years. And then the SpaceX Crew Dragon, you know, it was made in uh, the 2010 and later. So it's got newer, newer technology. For example, we have touch, uh, touch screens for controlling the vehicle. Um, it is a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more room inside of it than the Soyuz. Uh, so yeah, it looks it looks like a modern spacecraft, mm -hmm. um, whereas the Soyuz it kind of looks like an older an older spacecraft. However, the Soyuz is a very reliable, very robust uh, vehicle, and the SpaceX Crew Dragon, you know, this is only its second flight, second time that it's carried humans into space, and so we still have a lot to learn about this vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's really still uh, kind of a test uh, test flight for us. So um, it looks good. And so far, everything has been going really well. But, uh, you know, we still need to make sure that uh, it's reliable and gets us home safe and all of that. And so we still have some work to do on those to, just to verify all of that. Now, Commander Hopkins, you've taken a number of, uh, of spacewalks uh, as recently as just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was covered pretty widely in uh, certainly the U.S. media. Um, what is the sensation like when you're out there? I mean, you're you're tethered uh, to um, the space station, which is going 17,500 miles per hour. Um, and it looks to us like you're just floating around, but can you feel the velocity when you're out there? And then what, what is the sensation and what is the view like uh, when you're out there? Yeah, well, starting with the views, the views are incredible. Um, it's it's amazing when you don't have anything between you and the earth down there so all you're seeing it through is your is your visor uh, versus when you're inside the station you're looking out through the windows and everything and so it is a, a pretty incredible view but what does it feel like uh, it is a it is a bunch of emotions uh, you're nervous you're excited you're very focused 
so there's a there's a whole churn of, of emotions that are happening and when you when you get outside and so I would say you know I've heard people described if anybody out there in the crowd is as uh, a rock climber uh, I had a buddy that that described rock climbing and he one of the reasons he loved it was because when he got out there and was rock climbing everything else went away all the problems everything was focused on just climbing and that's the same thing when you go out on the spacewalk uh, when you get out there you're focused very much on the spacewalk itself you know every time I've been outside there's been a few moments where you kind of question and you ask yourself what am I doing mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when you look down at the earth you talk about you talk about that speed and you can see it then and so you know most of the time we're very focused and we're looking just at a, a piece of station right in front of our face because that's what we're working on but sometimes when you glance down you can uh, get a sensation that's that speed sensation and that can be a little bit disturbing uh, but I remember on uh, one of my last ones I was uh, we were translating out to the very end of the space station mm -hmm. out to the edge and it was night and I gotta tell you it's very there's not a lot of lights uh, out on the space station and so it was uh, I mean it was dark it was just as black as you can imagine say if you've been in a cave or something like that and so it was very hard to see where we were going very easy believe it or not to get lost when you're out there as well uh, it can be a little bit disorienting so uh, but at the same time you just uh, you'd go one step at a time and the next thing you know you're coming in about six seven hours later and you've had a successful EVA a spacewalk I, I have to ask the question that uh, you know how has space travel changed your perspective on life I, I imagine in many ways um, but what what are some ways that 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 really jump out at you that it's changed the way you see life and and you think about how you fit in the cosmos yeah that's a that's a great question and um, you know one of the things that happens when you when you get up here and I've mentioned this um, to uh, to my my sons before but your your worldview it, it changes so it gets very small mm -hmm. because it's just the six, seven of us inside this little vehicle and and so it really shrinks down um, but at the same time it gets huge mm -hmm. because when you do look out the window and you see the entire earth it's a very big perspective yeah. and so when you do see that you actually have that sense of how connected we all are because you can see this very thin atmosphere and that's what's keeping us all alive mm -hmm. and and so you realize just how critical that is for all of us it doesn't matter where we're from what country we're from what nationality and and so you just can see you know there's no borders that you see from uh, above uh, from the International Space Station um, and so <clears throat> that piece of it's very interesting and then the other piece for me as well you know I'm I am Catholic as well and uh, when I see the earth from this vantage point I, it's it's just breathtaking and I almost feel like it's uh, when I look down I, I, I see God's canvas mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a, a beautiful um, amazing planet and uh, and tru truly incredible Wow, that's, that's really, really powerful. Well, one of our Notre Dame engineering professors, Tenfli Ten uh, Ten Luau, uh, has an upcoming experiment uh, that you're going to be um, using here on the space station in April. Um, it's, it involves bubbles in the weightless environment uh, to help detect cancer cells uh, earlier in patients. So my question is, how do you do experiments up there regularly? And, and, and there are a couple of experiments that maybe or one that just jumps out in your mind. Yeah, so, you know, science, that's the whole reason for this. It is a national laboratory, uh, the International Space Station. And uh, we are doing probably within my six months that I'll be up here, we'll do 300 plus experiments will we'll take place while we're up here. Um, and there's really one of the ways I like to describe um, how we do science up here. There's the ones where we're very involved uh, because we're the test subjects. And so um, we might be looking at um, how our diet can impact our bone loss. And so that's mm -hmm. something that is important not only for us up here, but as we age on Earth as well. Um, other type of science that we do, we will actually set up the experiment and then the investigators on the ground will actually execute it and sometimes they're executing those experiments while we're sleeping mm -hmm. and then some of my favorite ones are where we're 
we're interfacing with the, the investigators, with the scientists real time. And so, for example, right here, we've got uh, a, um, a little satellite that we have on board. And so there's a couple of them up here, and they can do um, where they're doing different controls to see how they behave, how they uh, station keep with each other. And a lot of times when you're doing experiments like this, you're interfacing with the, the investigators real time. And that's a lot of fun because they bring a lot of enthusiasm up with them uh, when, they, when they get to work with you. Um, so some of the things that I've been uh, working on um, that's been pretty interesting, for example, we have worms on board right now. And we're actually looking at how space, the microgravity environment, impacts their muscles. Hmm. And some of those worms are, have compromised uh, immune systems as well. And, and so you're able to uh, see um, some of the impacts a little bit differently in this microgravity environment. And, and so there's a lot of different experiments that are going on up here. Uh, but some of those are it's pretty neat because we look at them under, the, uh, under a microscope. And you can see these little worms just going all, all over the place. Uh, but uh, very, very interesting, very uh, good results that we're getting out of that right now. Fascinating. Well, you're going to be on the, uh, the International Space Station uh, together with the crew for a total of six months, which is the longest of, of any U.S. astronaut crew ever. And the question is, what do you feel is the impact or understand the impact to be of zero gravity on your bodies? And then... Uh, upon your return to Earth, how long will it take for you to recover? And what can you do to speed up that recovery process? Yeah, so, uh, you know, six months, that is the standard mission up here. And so when we've launched on the Soyuz, that's about how long we've stayed. Um, and so the U.S. vehicles that are bringing us up here now is same kind of uh, length in terms of uh, about six months or so. We have had astronauts that have stayed up here for not quite a year, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the things that uh, I mentioned earlier, that bone loss, that uh, muscle atrophy, uh, all of that can happen. Uh, we've got impacts to the eyes. Um, edema, where you have a swelling of the optical nerve. We get mm -hmm. this fluid shift that happens. Uh, you know, your heart doesn't have to work as hard. Uh, there's a lot of things that mm -hmm. um, are, are going to be negative when you come back to Earth. And so one of the things we do is that exercise. We do that, uh, again, that couple hours a day, and that helps prepare us for coming back to Earth. And it, it shortens that time, minimizes the time, recovery time when we do get back. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for you to recover. Uh, so, for example, after my first flight, I had oh, about 2.5%, uh, 3% bone loss. And it took years before that came back. I did wow. have the uh, swelling of the optical nerve, the edema. And, again, that took uh, a year or more to get back. Now, some of the more um, obvious things like, you know, just the vestibular system and, you know, the nausea and, and not being very stable and all of that, that can come back pretty quick where you feel normal uh, within days or weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the other things can take much, much longer. And so, in fact, as astronauts, once you've flown in space, you will, uh, NASA will bring you back to Johnson Space Center every year, even after you've left, to give you a medical because uh, you're a test subject for the rest of your life at that point. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, there's clearly some major sacrifices that you made and, and your body's had to adapt. Now, you and the crew are scheduled to return on May 1st. Um, how long will the, uh, the trip be from the space station um, back to Earth? And, and when you think about both traveling from Earth to the space station and then the return trip home, um, which to you is, is more challenging? And, uh, you know, as you enter the Earth's atmosphere and, and uh, you know, you're passing through some incredibly hot temperatures, is it, is it difficult? Are you are you concerned about landing in the ocean and, and, and making it back? Uh, you're certainly concerned. I mean, the the uh, the launch and the landing are are probably the highest risk uh, times for an astronaut. Um, spacewalks as well are probably the the riskier uh, things that we do. 
Um, in terms of the amount of time for the, the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle, we were about 24 hours from the time we launched until we actually docked to the space station. And when we go home, it could be that long as well from the time we undock till we actually splash down off the coast of Florida. Or depending on the orbital mechanics, we could actually be home within uh, seven hours or so where we're splashing down. Wow. Uh, both uh, coming up, going uphill and coming downhill are, are pretty exciting. Um, the, the rocket uh, riding on that Falcon 9 going uphill, uh, that was that was impressive. It mm -hmm. was, uh, you definitely knew you were going somewhere and you were going somewhere fast. Uh, we <laughs> all had big smiles on our face, feeling that acceleration. Uh, but coming home, uh, obviously there's some very critical times there. And so when we first enter the atmosphere, you're basically free falling from when you enter that atmosphere at uh, 60, uh, 60 miles. And then our drogues, uh, our first parachutes don't, don't come out until about five, uh, five point seven, six miles or so. Wow. And then the main parachute doesn't come out until two, uh, two miles above the earth. And so you're just free falling for a, for a very long time. And then uh, that shock when those chutes open, that's, uh, that's pretty dynamic. And <laughs> so, and, and the last thing I'd say about the entry, what's, what's interesting about that as well, and, and it's really hard on the families because as we're coming into the atmosphere, we've got all of this plasma, that, that superheated plasma that's going around the vehicle, and um, that interferes with our comm system. Hmm. And so for your family that's sitting on the ground, there's, they're not hearing any calls. And oftentimes what happens when you're supposed to come out, the ground teams will start making calls, what we call in the blind. And so they'll just, they'll call SpaceX or uh, Dragon, this is uh, SpaceX, how copy? And we may not answer. And so that's very, it's uh, because we, right. we haven't got our comm back. Right. And so that can be very challenging, very uh, uh, difficult for the families because you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And when you come out of that, that's about the time that the chutes are opening and all of that. Uh, so it, it can be very uh, nerve-wracking, you know, for us as the astronauts on board. Right. You've got a job to do. You're monitoring uh, data. You're monitoring the systems. Uh, but for the families that are just sitting there and, and waiting to, to hear confirmation, that can be pretty challenging. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point that uh, your incredible service uh, to, uh, to, to country and, and the planet um, is, is, uh, is shared very much by your family and all that they go through uh, in that process. Um, in wake of the historic uh, landing of Perseverance on Mars, what do you see as the next great uh, um, space milestones? And what are you most excited about in the coming years? Yeah, so I think the, the next uh, major milestone is going to be getting back to the moon. And I know we've, you know, we've been there before. Uh, but that was a long time ago, and so it just gives you a sense of how difficult it is to get to the moon. And I think the difference is this time is it'll be more of a permanent presence when we get there, as well as it's going to be testing out those technologies that are going to be necessary to get to Mars, and that is the next step. So you see perseverance there, and, you know, in another 20 years or so, uh, you're going to see humans there. And so I think that's, uh, that's pretty exciting, and perseverance is leading the way with that. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, I have one final question for you. And uh, w when you look back historically at the, at the great uh, explorers, pioneers um, over the course of history, is there one that you look to as a role model, one that inspires you um, more than others and, and why? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question because there has been uh, some amazing uh, explorers over the years. And I think for me, um, the, the early, you know, the original seven, mm -hmm. the uh, astronauts, the, uh, the early Apollo astronauts, the Gemini astronauts, they, you know, we've had opportunities. Every, every couple years we have an astronaut reunion, and we've been very fortunate to have some of those astronauts come back and speak to us. And when you hear what they were doing and how they were doing it and the risks that they were taking, it's, it's truly amazing. And so they, uh, they are definitely the, uh, the inspiration for me. Uh, they are definitely the giants uh, that we're standing on their shoulders uh, because uh, we wouldn't be here today without, without their efforts uh, from before. Well, we have a, um, a little surprise for you to close our, our session today. Um, we're joined by a, a very special guest here, a Notre Dame student and your son, Lucas. So we wanted him to, uh, uh, to be here and be able to say hello to you. 
Hi. <laughs> Lucas. How's it going? It's great to hear your voice. It's going very, very well. Uh, and I got to tell you, it's, uh, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this um, uh, that, you know, Julie and I, um, we trust uh, the Notre Dame, the Notre Dame family with our son. And that is certainly uh, one of the most precious things for us, our uh, Lucas and his brother, Ryan. And, and so uh, we certainly have been very, very happy with, uh, with Notre Dame and, and just Lucas's experience. It's, it's been fantastic hearing all of his stories and how much fun he's been having, how much he's been learning as well. Um, so Lucas, uh, it's great to, to hear your voice. And uh, again, I just want to say thank you um, to, to the whole Notre Dame community. Oh, and I actually also want to say thank you to, uh, to uh, Father Brogan. Um, I don't know if you, if you know this, but Lucas almost didn't get to come to, um, come to the launch oh. because he got put in quarantine for COVID about, uh, I don't know, I guess it was about a week before the launch. Uh, maybe, actually it was about nine days before the launch. And so the Notre Dame community came together, Father Brogan, and, and uh, they really helped us out. And so Lucas, uh, when he got out of, the, out of quarantine, he was on a plane that afternoon, and, and he was able to come down and, and be a part of the launch, which was extremely important for his mother and, and me and his, and his brother. And so um, that, that comes from uh, being a family. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say that, I talk about the whole Notre Dame family. And you guys have been amazing, and uh, we just absolutely love being a part of it. No, it's fantastic. Well, you know, Father Brogan Ryan is the, the rector of Keough Hall, and, and uh, I don't know if, uh, if you want to say anything uh, about Lucas, what it was like for you to be there for the launch. I mean, you had to have some butterflies in your stomach, and, but, but uh, what kind of feelings did you experience? I mean, definitely. It was crazy, just a crazy week beforehand, and then flying down to Florida and getting to experience everything, all the events that we were going through, and then the night of the launch, uh, we were on a rooftop about a mile and a half away, and just the feeling as soon as the rocket ignited, just the heart started going. The like, It was just very, very cool to watch, but at the same time, as soon as the rocket ignited, it was also very nerve-wracking because you're like, oh my goodness, my dad is currently strapped to a rocket flying yeah. into space. So yeah. that was definitely a little, a little scary at first, but about a minute or two into it, you just fully appreciate it all. And then it was so cool to watch. Well, he's obviously so proud of you, as are we. And I have to tell you one, uh, one quick uh, maybe closing story here is uh, our um, former uh, president, Father uh, Ted Hesburgh, uh, who passed away six years ago, um, was fascinated by, uh, by space travel. And in fact, he was on the list before the, the Challenger mishap to, um, to actually um, be one of the civilians to fly into outer space. And he had worked out everything uh, about how he was going to be the first priest uh, to be able to celebrate the Eucharist, to celebrate mass in zero gravity. And he can, could tell you to a detail how he had worked out the chalice and the host and and all of that. So um, he wanted to be the first to bring Christ and, and, and the presence of, of God um, beyond this world to the universe uh, as, a, as a Catholic priest. And I just want you to know that uh, uh, Commander Hopkins, you and your crew continue to be very much in, in our prayers. Um, we are grateful for the sacrifices that you and your family make on behalf of this nation and on behalf of this international collaborative um, to push um, the boundaries of, of, uh, of what we know as society and as community. Let me ask you just one final question. Do you feel that, that in your travels there could be life that exists beyond this planet in some form? And can you repeat that one real quick again? Do you believe that in your, through your travels, there could be life that exists beyond the planet Earth in some form? You know, there, there are so many uh, stars and, and systems that are out there. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that there's not life um, out there somewhere. Uh, but if there is, it's all part of God's plan. And, and I do have to say uh, just one last thing. I, I was very fortunate as well 
um, I was able to bring the Eucharist up uh, with me, and, and so I've been able to receive communion uh, pretty much on a weekly basis. Uh, before I went out on my spacewalks, I, uh, I received communion, and for me it was extremely important uh, just to know that Jesus was with me when I was in those, uh, in those situations. And, and so uh, very, very special, um, and uh, again, uh, just I, I feel very fortunate and blessed. Well, I know that you were uh, a captain of the Fighting Illini uh, football team back in your day, but uh, we're still hopeful that we can, uh, you know, sway you over to be uh, uh, even a bigger, you know, uh, Fighting Irish football fan, and, and maybe we'll be able to welcome you back together with your family on campus this fall. We sure hope so. And, uh, and uh, at that point, uh, beyond COVID and everything, give you a big embrace and, uh, and, and, uh, and a heartfelt thanks and an expression of love for all that you've sacrificed on behalf of so many. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and I'd just like to say that uh, for all of you down on earth, you know, because up here uh, we're all pretty safe. Uh, we've not had the, uh, you know, we quarantined before we came up here, so we knew we came up without COVID. But I know you guys have done an amazing job of being able to have in-person classes um, throughout all of this. And, and so very, very impressive. Um, and I want to thank you for that as well. And uh, just thank you for the opportunity to share, to share this, uh, this amazing experience with all of you. Thank you. Take care. God bless and go Irish.